Uh, yeah, so I wanted to talk to you today about GraphQL caching and specifically the future potentials for creating a more GraphQL native caching system by using defer and stream. My name is Andreas Heiberg. I'm the engineering manager at Stellate, and we help scale uh, or build tools to operate GraphQL servers at scale. And one of those tools is a edge cache or a CDN for specifically for GraphQL. And so that's why we've been thinking about it and why I wanted to share with you today. Before we kind of start, how many people have helped maintain a GraphQL server? So most of us, right? How many people have tried caching GraphQL responses? Not many of us. <laughs> okay, so this will be interesting. Uh, so why do people cache, right? The most fundamental reason is cost reduction. Um, as an example, one of our big customers, Puma, they saw a 40% overall uh, infrastructure cost reduction by caching their responses, right? And why is that? Well, it's very expensive to go to the database, to the Elasticsearch cluster and whatnot to compute these GraphQL responses. It's a lot cheaper if you can just store the same response over and over again and give it to the customer without having to do any compute, right? So that's what caching allows you to do. And another reason is speed. Um, the way modern CDNs work is that we have nodes all around the world that are really close to your customers. And so if you have a cache response, you can see response times of like 50 milliseconds, which is a bit ridiculous. And the third reason is scale, right? Uh, when you see a massive influx of traffic, you want to not have downtime. Uh, and that is made much easier if the requests never come to your origin. Uh, so that's part of uh, why caching is really cool. And so how does GraphQL caching work? Many of us have not tried it, so I'll try to explain it in brief. There's a bunch of different solutions out there. Uh, but in essence, they all work the same way. Um, you look at, you have a GraphQL request coming in. The server will look at that and say, what are the types and fields in here? And do I have any caching config for those, right? Have I said, okay, for the product field, for example, I want to cache that for one day. And so based on this information, you will add a cache control header to the response saying, please cache this for one day. Well, one of the difficulties here is if you have multiple max ages in your document. Let's say the product, uh, the product here is cached, um, but let's say we add another, another field like uh, similar products, right? Say you're a front-end developer and you're being asked to add uh, product recommendations to a product page, right? You go to the query, you add the similar fields, uh, similar products to, the, to your query. Uh, you implement the front-end, everything's good. You release it to production, all is good, right? But now your SREs or your infrastructure team comes and they complain. They say, you just <laughs> destroyed our server. We're getting all this incoming traffic. Nothing is being cached anymore. And the reason for that is the GraphQL cache looks at all the types and it has to take the minimum max age in that body, in that, uh, in that document. Because you don't want to cache things for longer <laughs> than the backend developers would like you to do. And so in essence, what we've done is we pushed all this complexity of caching onto the front end developers. Right? You cannot make a good query without knowing the caching time of every single field in that query. That is rather frustrating as a front-end developer. Um, yeah, and so how, how do we solve this, right? A lot of our customers, the way that they solve this is they manually go and split the queries. They will make one query which has, has a bunch of fields that can be cached and some other fields which cannot, which cannot be cached, right? And so now they're making two separate requests which is not the benefit of GraphQL, right? There's a reason that GraphQL was made in this way of having a single request. So it, it slows down the, the experience. And also this backend complexity of caching is still in front end. We actually added to it. We have to maintain multiple queries now. Uh, and this also gets even worse from the backend perspective, right? I, as a backend developer, say you have a subgraph and you want to cache your subgraph and make sure your service stays up. You put all this, this caching configuration in there, but it's not helping you because front-end developers can break the cache any day, right? And so this gets really frustrating. And so one solution that we're proposing or have come up with and have started rolling out to our customers is to build a more uh, GraphQL native caching system, right? One where, one where you don't have a single max age, max age per document, but rather multiple max ages, right? So it, in, in practice, you have the query coming in, you look at all those types and fields, you come up with the max ages, and instead of coming up with a single uh, content header, you split the query into multiple parts that can be cached independently, but doing this transparently to the client. I'm not gonna give much more detail, it's a big topic, <laughs> but uh, focusing specifically on, on caching and stream instead. So this is really awesome, right? The front-end developers can build whatever queries that they want without impacting the cache hit rate. 
And so we get all the benefits that we discussed at the start about caching, right? Lower infrastructure costs and so on. Um, but this uh, solution is not complete, right? We can definitely lower infrastructure costs, but we cannot give fast response times. And why is that? So the query comes in, uh, we get all this product information, it's in our cache, we get it immediately very quickly, but we can't return the response yet because the similar products that's in that query, the cache doesn't have that because we were explicitly told not to cache it. So now we need to go to the origin and get the similar products, right? That might take a long time. It's definitely not gonna take 50 milliseconds, I can almost guarantee that. And so we wait for the origin to give us all this data, these similar products, and only then can we return it to the client. Right? So this is fairly slow and inefficient. Luckily, the smarter people than I have <laughs> created this concept of defer and stream, which we might be able to leverage. And so, questions. How many people have used defer and stream? That's a surprising amount. That is really cool. Uh, but this is a really good use case, right? And so <clears throat> the way that defer and stream works is that you allow the front-end developer to put some intent into the query, right? still a single query, you're still requesting all this data in one go, but you say the similar products is not part of my initial experience. I can render the product page without it, but I would like it later, right? And then uh, in the back end, when the server, when the, when the GraphQL uh, edge cache gets this request, we see immediately all the product information is in the cache and we can return it in the first payload back in 50 milliseconds, but there's more data to, to get, right? So then we go to the origin, we fetch all the similar products, and only when the origin has responded can we return that in a second payload, and luckily clients have support for this. As, as we just heard, there's multiple iterations incoming on the spec, but, but this is the general gist of it. And so in summary, uh, the thing that I, I came here to talk about was uh, HTTP caching is great. It's what we use right now. It's delivering a lot of value, but there's significant uh, drawbacks in developer experience, in cost, in performance, uh, and we've come up with this new way of doing it, which is way more GraphQL native, of splitting the queries in a transparent way for the front end uh, and getting these, these uh, lovely cache hit rates. But in order to really make it powerful, to really make it fast, to make it work uh, like we expect caching to do, we need defer and stream. And so we're very excited for the future ahead. Uh, yeah, and thank you so much for coming. Uh, really appreciate it. And yeah, as I mentioned, I work at Stellate. We have a booth. We have the best swag in the business. So <laughs> please come and get some swag. Uh, and I also recently started hosting uh, the GraphQL Conf, uh, the GraphQL podcast, not the conference, sadly, <laughs> uh, the GraphQL podcast. And so if you have anything interesting to talk about to the general GraphQL community, I'd be happy to talk to you and have you on the podcast. So yeah, thank you so much. I don't know if we have time for questions. Oh, I have two minutes. Any questions? Right. What's the implication of a cache misses? Yeah, yeah so the, the same thing. Um, so it's not a normalized cache, but as I said, we have these multiple cache buckets. And so if there's part of that query that is no longer in the cache, we can go to the origin and fetch it. And depending on whether it's been deferred or not, we, we would have to defer that initial return to the client, right? So say, uh, say there's a cache miss and that data is deferred, then we can still return the initial response from the cache and go and get fetched from the origin and vice versa. If it hasn't been deferred, we have to block the entire response for the origin, right? As you would expect, yeah. Uh, I think you were first. Uh, right. The so currently, the way caching works is that for the first cache miss, it, you have to go and fetch the entire body, right? Okay. It, it's the entire response. Sure. In this concept of uh, partial query caching, yeah. we would only go to the origin for the sections that are not in the cache, right. right? So, you know, depending on how many buckets you have, how many max ages, you have a smaller and smaller, smaller buckets in the cache, and so you would only go and fetch from the origin what is kind of the minimal set of fields that uh, that were missed. Yeah, so 
also our current caching product that you can go and use right now. It has um, stale while, while revalidate, right? And so yeah, there, there are more settings that I discussed here, but yeah, for sure, uh, you can configure that so that even if the response is uh, one day stale, you can still return that immediately and then go and revalidate the cache in the background without impacting the kind of customer performance, right? You, you're getting this fast response times. Yeah, this is very much supported. I mean, also in our current product, but I can't talk about everything. But yeah, we have this concept of scopes, which allows you to have kind of dynamic cache buckets. So you can support uh, headers, and cookies, and uh, JWTs, a few other things. You can run functions on it, all this kind of stuff. But yeah, essentially, you just tell the cache, you know, I want the language header to be part of the cache bucket, right? So you would get a cache bucket for each language. I'd love to talk about it with people that have that problem. <laughs> but uh, because of the way our caching works, it's at the edge, right? Which has a lot of benefits. And then if you put it in front of a subgraph within your infrastructure, it has some cons, right? Uh, so there are situations where you would want to like, co-locate uh, our cache closer to your subgraph. Uh, but it's an open area of research, I suppose. Uh, not many customers have that problem. All right, I think that's all the questions. And I think we're also over time. So thank you very much for your time.